This is One Man's Family. One Man's Family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Today we present Chapter 14, Book 70, entitled, San Francisco Answers Back. Attention, please. Special information. You will hear the next episode of One Man's Family tomorrow night, Monday evening, July 4th. That's Monday, tomorrow night. In the East, your station will carry the show at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time. On the Pacific Coast, 8.30 Standard Time. Check your local newspapers, but don't forget, you will hear One Man's Family tomorrow evening and every Monday night thereafter over most of these stations. It's now definitely summer vacation schedule with the barbers up at the Sky Ranch. That is, for all except young Pinky, who is on his first job away from home, which is with a lumber camp in Northern California. As we said, all except Pinky and Paul and his 16-year-old niece, Joan. There's been a little friction between Joan and her folks, and Paul has persuaded Claudia and Nikki to let her stay in town with him and work at the airfield. This is the day she moves in. Nobody in the big old family home except these two making their way to Paul's quarters at the top of the house. Yeah, first lap, Joan. Now up the last little flight and we'll be at the top of the house. Paul Barber's own domain. Mm, super. I wish you'd let me carry one of the suitcases the rest of the way, Paul. Oh, they're not heavy, honey. Go ahead, up you go. These steps are a little steeper, aren't they? Oh, I'm so excited I could butter myself. What's that? About moving up here with you. Just think I'll be here all summer with a job and everything. That's right. There. Ah, hear my little squeak? What? Listen. See? When you get at the top and step here, there's a little squeak. Oh, I never noticed that before. Maybe I shouldn't have told you. Now you can step over it and I won't be able to check on you when you come in. Paul, you won't have to check on me. I'm not going to do anything that you don't want me to this summer. Oh, of course not. I was kidding. Oh. Oh, here, let me open the door. I'll take this luggage into my room first. Oh, Okay. After you, my pretty maiden. Oh, golly, I just love it up here, Paul. I'll leave your bags here for the nonce. There we are. Well, everything seems to be in apple pie order. I can see Mom's hand in this. Take off your coat and find a good place to relax. Oh, boy, what a keen view you've got of the bay up here. I feel like I was right up on top of the world. I hope you stay there. Huh? I-, I meant being up so high. And I was talking about your spirits. Oh, You don't think I'm going to get tired of being here, do you? No, but it isn't going to be just one grand lock, you know. You've never had a job before, Joan, and you should know that after a few weeks, the newness will probably wear off a bit. Just because I've never worked before doesn't mean that I don't realize what it means. I know it isn't going to be all play. Easy now. I was just pointing out some of the negative things we had to look forward to, that's all. That's okay. Your grandmother let Mrs. Kettleman go on her vacation before we knew you were going to be here, but... I think it's just as well. We want to eat out most of the time anyway. Oh, Keen. Uh, let's go to funny little Italian and French places. Where we can get a lot to eat and don't have to pay much, huh? Now, you remember your promise, Paul. What promise? Don't throw something at me so suddenly like that. About the expenses. I'll be making money and I pay my own way. That was part of the bargain. Right. Oh, occasionally I shall play escort instead of guardian and then you'll be my guest. But the rest of the time, bring your money, gal. No money, no eating. All right. Well, let's get your stuff into your room, and then I'll leave you to yourself for a while. You go on in, and I'll fetch your luggage, being an old fetcher. Okay. I don't think I've been in this room since Teddy left. You haven't been one? I said I hadn't been in this room since Teddy left. Oh. Oh, Paul, I'd forgotten how cute it was. It's a nice little room. Not very big, I'm afraid, but you'll manage. Mm, It's so cozy right up here under these. A couple of places where you have to duck or you get a crack on the noggin. You've left everything just the way it was when Teddy was in here, haven't you? Just about. Uh, Paul. Hmm? Do you think Teddy will ever come back here? Well, um, I really don't know, Joan. Maybe someday. Do you miss her? Of course. Wouldn't I be pretty strange not to miss a daughter? Say, you think it's too warm in here? You want me to open a window? Oh, no, no, it's okay. Um, you and Teddy had a lot of pictures taken together, didn't you? She's got them hung all over the wall. And her teddy seemed to have a passion for pictures. She's so little in this one. Well, you're helping her sail a boat. Where was it taken? Hmm? Oh, that was out of Golden Gate Park. I've forgotten who took it of it. She had it enlarged, didn't she? Mm-hmm. Did she have them framed, or you? 
Well, most of them Teddy had done. Oh, here's Judge Hunter. This is his courtroom, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Was this when you adopted Teddy? Yes, Joe. Oh, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? He didn't have hardly any gray hairs then, Paul. No, yeah, they've been moving in on me pretty fast lately, so... Oh, I like gray hair. I think it looks distinguished. Yeah, people always think that when it's on the other fellow. Oh, but I really do. Oh, well, that's fine. Paul, did I make you feel sad talking about Teddy? No, honey. I didn't mean to if I did. Oh, here now. You start getting your things put away. Is there anything in the muscle line like the lifting of some heavy object you want done before I leave you? Oh, I don't think so, Paul. Okay, well, I'll leave you to your own devices for a while then. All right. And thank you, Paul, for fixing it so I could be here. Oh, I love it up here and you and, oh, just everything. Well, if it all works out the way I hope, you're going to have a pretty proud uncle by the end of summer. <laughs> And down at the Sky Ranch, it's just plain hot, so that most of the older members of the clan have taken to the shade, and all the children except young Hank have filed into the station wagon under Mother Barber's watchful eye for an ice cream soda binge out at the Skyline store. Father Barber is down in his hammock, and Dan Murray is standing on the edge of the swimming pool watching Hank just about to take off from the diving board. Hey, Dan, watch this dive. Okay, go ahead, Hank. You watching? Yeah. Here we go. Ho, 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 ho. You call that a dive? Oh, gosh, I, I slipped a little, I think. Oh, don't give me that, Hank, old boy. You just gave a fine exhibition of a belly flop, and you know it. Yeah, it did sting all right. Well, go on in and get your trunks on, Dan, and take a swim with me. The water swell. Oh, a little later, Hank. Hey, you're dripping on me. Oh, sorry. Gosh, can you imagine Pinky missing out on a deal like this? Going to an old lumber camp when he could be swimming every day. He's nuts. Oh, I don't know. He's showing some initiative, I'd say. Well, no slave labor for me. I wouldn't mind doing something dignified, but I can't see any percentage in just being a wage slave. Hank, what is this? Slave labor, wage slaves. You and Pink have been using that phrase pretty often lately. Oh, that's just a gag line. Gag? Sure. Of course, Pinky's got a different eye. Practically everybody in the world is a slave to some kind of a job. Well, maybe not the bosses, but everybody else. Oh, how silly can you get? Oh, Pink doesn't think so. Sometimes I kind of wonder. Look at people. Get up in the morning, gobble breakfast, rush off to work, sweat all day, come home, eat dinner, go to bed, and get up and do it all over again the next day. Do you ever stop to think what a feeling of satisfaction that might give a man? Satisfaction? Do you ever stop to consider the sense of security and well-being a person might have to know he's able to carry of carrying his own share of the world's work? That he's privileged to choose a job that... He's suited for, and that job will maintain him and his family and give that added ounce of impetus to our nation's economy and morale and stability. Yeah, but, Dad... Did you or Pink ever stop to consider the spiritual lift from a good job well done or the human dignity in work? Human dignity? Yes, Hank. Good gosh. Where's the dignity of sweating all day with a shovel or a monkey wrench or an oil can in your hand? Oh, my dear adolescent. Hey, Dan, I'm 16 years old. Yes, I'm quite aware of it. Then what's this adolescent business? Because you're so adolescent in your reasoning. Human dignity isn't based on the kind of work you do. Who hasn't seen some pretty important executives, some fairly high-up government officials, and a lot of other people in high places making themselves look awfully silly? Just because a man has a title doesn't give him human dignity. Dignity comes from within, from the self-assurance of accomplishment, from the know-how, the skill of muscles as well as mind. You know, Hank, I don't know any man in our whole community with any more of a sense of human dignity than our vegetable man. Yeah, I know him. Well, then you know what I mean. There's pride in the way he handles the lettuce and the peas and the cabbages which he grew and now brings to us. He knows they're fine, and he knows he's a master of his art. Well, I've seen a man with a pick swing it with sheer pride and goodwill because he knew he was stronger and more adept with that pick than any man looking at him. You mean if a man likes his job? Yeah, but Pink says nobody really likes to work. He says who really likes to be tied down in an office or on a truck or, or in a factory? All self-respecting persons do. If a man's good at his job, he loves to do it. And it doesn't make any difference what kind of a job it is. He'll be happy and contented with it if he's given an opportunity to be so. No job is degrading in itself. It's only degrading if his fellow men make him think it is. Only if his employers misuse him. You really believe that, Dan? I know it, Hank. The majority of mankind loves physical labor. Welcomes a chance to coordinate his mind and his muscles. Because we're basically a strong, active animal. It's only when we're belittled in our own minds and in other people's minds that we lose the will to do our best. Believe me, Hank, never speak of the workers of America as wage slaves or whatever it is you said. 
because it just isn't true. American people love to work. They need to work to be happy. And when you do what you want in this world, it can never be slavery. Never. Yeah, I told Pink he was crazy. Only his arguments sounded pretty good. Well, don't mine sound more reasonable? <laughs> you bet. And that's how I like to think of the American people. We all do. Not as slaves, not as people with their noses on the grindstone, but as honorable men and women who go about their daily jobs because they're happier at work than at any other occupation. Hi there, Claudia. Hi, Hank. Oh, Dan, Hank thought you were down at the stable with Nicky. Oh, I was, but I'm back. What can I do for you? Not a thing. Come on out to the new side porch when you haven't anything better to do. We'll all be there. I'll do that little thing. Oh, where is Hazel? Oh, uh, she just stopped in the living room a minute to see Cliff. She and Cliff have some kind of a winding underway. Strange and quiet sitting in here, Cliff. Are you all right? Oh, sure, Hazel, sure. Oh, why don't you come out and join us on the porch? Well, I will in a minute. I, I've been trying to remember something, anything, about Irene. Irene? Oh, uh, you want me to go? No, no, Hazel, please. I, I guess I'm scared. I lived in this, in this house, right in these rooms, here at the Sky Ranch, for years with this girl. Now I can't even remember her, Hazel. It, it, it scares you a little. I've been staring at this picture. It's Irene. You say it's Irene. I was married to her. She was my wife. No matter how long I look at it, she's just a very pretty face and a name. I can't bring back anything. Maybe you shouldn't try, Cliff. That's what everybody says. Maybe you shouldn't try, Cliff. Take it easy, old boy. Relax. Be glad you're still alive. Does anyone in this household have the faintest idea what it's like to have 11 whole years wiped out like... like figures off a blackboard? 11 years just... Just gone? But trying isn't going I'll tell you something to try, Hazel. Try waking up some morning on a pleasant day in 1938. Only it's 1949. Try finding yourself with a son you didn't even know you had. And all the faces around you with 11 extra years on them. Years that you lived to and can't remember. And just get nothing. Nothing at all if I... I'm sorry, Hazel. No, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right, Cliff. You ever look into a big telescope out into space trying to get hold of a billion miles of nothing? Once. So did I once. Ever try to figure where space ends, maybe? Once? Yeah. Well, that'll give you the general idea. If I could just get a glimpse of living here with Irene, just any kind of a glimpse, I'd... I don't see how I could have done it. Could have done what? Hazel, I loved Anne. So what was I up to when I married Irene? What was it, rebound? Well, Cliff, you're doing yourself an injustice. Now, believe me, Irene was a dear, lovely person, gentle and really good. She was a loyal, uh, whither thou goest, I will go sort of person. Please believe me, we all loved her. We were all glad when you found her. Yeah, those are nice words, and I like them. Cliff, but... you were at loose ends until you met Irene. All right, all right. There's one thing I can't get through my thick, cracked bean, Hazel. She could be charming and gentle and really good and loyal and all that without caring a whole lot for my son. Well, I want to know one thing. Did Andy have any trouble with her? Oh, of course not, Cliff. I don't know where you get this idea that you and Irene were bad for Skip, for Andy. She wasn't his mother? I don't know why you're dwelling on this. Because I found Andy living with Nicky and Claudia, that's why. Because nobody's being honest about it. They look embarrassed when I ask questions. So something was haywire. And I just want to find out what it was. Skippy... I can't remember to call him Andy Cliff. Skippy just blended in with the whole family after Ann died. He just belonged to everybody, and everybody belonged to Skippy. And then you married Irene. And you and she and Skippy came to live here at the Sky Ranch. And you never saw such a happy little boy as Skippy. That's true? It's all true? All true. If you have any doubts, Sometimes sit down and talk to Skippy about Irene. Well, why hasn't somebody said this to me before? Well, it's still hard for us to talk about Irene even yet. You know, she was going to give Skippy a little brother when she was killed. Hazel, she... She, she was... I, I was... Uh, yes. Her confinement was only a month or six weeks away. But I don't know her. She was my wife. She was going to have my child, and, and I don't know her. Oh, wait, wait, just a minute, Cliff. Uh, where, where is that old Bible? Well, if it's more pictures... No, no, that... no, it's Reverend MacArthur's eulogy to Irene. Father made a copy of what he said that day. Here it is. Now you close your eyes, Cliff, and listen. 
There was everything in Mr. MacArthur's voice that day. His affection for Irene, his sympathy for you and family, and and there was faith. It was deeply felt, deeply sincere. They are always like Mr. MacArthur. We who live upon this earth for so short a span must not grieve too deeply when one or another among us drops by the wayside to return to Mother Earth from whence our corporeal being came. Rather should there be happiness and deep soul-stirring satisfaction in the knowledge that the soul and spirit lives on, not only in that beautiful realm of God of which we know so little, but here on Earth. For no one can doubt that the sweetness and goodness and gentleness which was Irene will continue to live and permeate and make fragrant all the places which were her earthly haunts. She brought something fine into the world, and it must remain, even though she has departed. We should be thankful that she was allowed to be with us for a little, and not bitter that she has gone from us for a little. That was... That was Irene, my wife? That is the girl we all remember. Mail's here, mail's here. Hey, Nicky, where is everybody? Oh, well, here you are, Jack. How about a return game of horses, old boy? But, Nicky, the mail's here. Oh, no, I don't want to see it. Huh? Why not? It has a rather depressing appearance, old boy. You know, these improvements we made up here this spring have inspired a lively correspondence with a local tradesman. Oh, that's it. <laughs> no, I don't think there's a bill in the whole batch, Nicky. But look at the mail today. Yes, hey, quite an avalanche. Well, hey, Dad, mail's here. Letters for you, lots of them. There it is, Jack. I'm coming. So where are you going to be? It's a gang out on the new porch. We'll go around there. Well, just a moment and I'll be with you. Yeah, take the mail around to the gathering on the porch. And you know, Dan, I wonder what Pinky's finding in a lumber camp he likes better than this. With Pinky, it may have been ambition or a sudden adolescent distaste for being warm and well-fed and comfortable. <laughs> Pinky disliking comfort? I don't believe it. No, it does happen, Claudia, when you're 16 or 17. Sudden revulsion against conveniences and comfort and your loved ones. I told Hazel that... What'd you tell Hazel, Dan? Oh, come and join us, my dear. Clifford coming? Yes, he's coming presently. We were talking about you, Hazel. Come and join me in the glider. I was telling Claudia about Pinky. I'll never know what got into him. He just couldn't bear the thought of staying home this summer. Room enough? Oh, lots, thanks. The mail came a moment ago. Jack and Nicky are bringing it up. I hope there's a letter from your traveler. Oh, what were you saying about Pinky, Dan? Oh, oh. well, uh, after Hazel agreed to him getting a summer job, I said I'd help him get one. I wouldn't promise what kind, but we'd pay his fare to it, and after that he was strictly on his own. He wanted to get just as far away from home as he possibly could. I just don't understand it. <laughs> you would if you'd ever been a 16-year-old boy. It's an itch. I uh, I read a line once that covers it. Your heels are on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Good day, Nicky. Here they are. Oh, Jack, bring the mail. Coming. Is there anything from Pinky? Might be, Hazel. You never saw such a batch of stuff. Bills for us for repair on the Sky Ranch, I'll bet. Not a bill in the lot. Huh? Astonishing, too, isn't it? You know, the promptest correspondence I've ever had in my life were in the accounting department of the local... Oh, come on up, Dad. There was a safari for sodas and ice cream out to the Skyline store. Mother went along. Was she in that station wagon? An ice cream soda compulsion hit the very young generation, boom, like that. <laughs> it was a sort of mass movement, a perfect tidal wave. You couldn't stop it. Here's a chair, Father Barber. Thank you. Thank you. Well, where's Clifford? Uh, he's in the library. Jack, you're up. Yeah, I'll get him. Uh, Jack, you're going off with the letters. I'll bring them back, Dad. Cliff? Hey, Cliff, postman's been here. Anything for me? Big batch of stuff. Come on out. Well, here we go. I feel like Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, oh, a uh, letter for Claudia. Thank you. Oh, oh, Nikki. Here's one. Transparent front on it, no doubt. <laughs> it's the bill, all right. My mistake. Uh, well, the gathering of the clan. Uh, come along, Cleaver. Come along. Letter for Dad. Huh? From whom? Dr. Fred Thompson. Oh, that's good, Frederick. Drumming up a little business, I suppose. Magazine for Claudia. Magazine for Claudia. Magazine for Claudia. <laughs> Gosh, when do you get time to read them? I don't. Mother does. She's hanging from a cliff in five continued stories. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there anything from Pinky? Not yet. Dad. 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 
Dad, <laughs> what, what, is, what is all this? Dad. Looks like fan mail. Dad. <laughs> what happened? Dad. That one's from the San Francisco Junior Chamber of Commerce. Junior Chamber? You'd think the Senior Chamber would write to an old party like Dad, wouldn't you? <laughs> Don't be flippant, Skipper. Don't be flippant. Well, this is a confusion of riches. Aha. What is it? I wonder if this could be what you're looking for, Hazel. From Pinky. From uh, Wilderness Camp Number Four, Siskiyou County, California. Wilderness Camp. That sounds good. Sounds perfectly dreadful. Let's have it. Oh, oh but it isn't addressed to you, Hazel. From Mr. Daniel Murray Esquire, <clears throat> from William Herbert Murray, airmail, smudged and blotted. Oh, Dan, <laughs> open it quickly. Now, what do you know about this? Now, here is a perfectly vicious letter from that nosy, sawbone Fred Thompson. Says he's heard I'm planning to move my family to the city of Los Angeles. Oh, look here. Dr. Thompson says what? Who's moving to Los Angeles? Hey, you see how rumors get started? And here's one from Mrs. DuPont Jackson Powers, and one from the Sea Cliff Garden Club, and several from friends and neighbors, all violently opposed to our moving to Los Angeles. Dad, who's moving to Los Angeles? Is anybody around here moving somewhere? I hadn't heard about it. Hot down there, isn't it? You will. Cold and foggy up here sometimes, old one. Uh, Dan, what about Pinky's letter? Uh, uh, just hold on a second. What's happening here, Father Barber? What is all this? Oh, it's a rumor, Daniel. Last week, the Los Angeles Junior Chamber of Commerce, very flattering, I'm sure. Yes, yes. The Los Angeles Junior Chamber of Commerce said, in public, mind you, said that we were a representative California family, and we should recognize the fact that life can be lived to the fullest in Southern California. If life could be any fuller in Southern California, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> there speaks the mother of three lively Jews. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Dante, how did this come about? Sir? I don't know, Nick. This was an open letter. They phoned me about it. Oh, there was also something in the San Francisco Chronicle, I believe. Hey, I missed that. You see how word gets around? Now, here are all these people who have heard a rumor. And so they think we're moving to Southern California. Well, maybe we should take a vacation down there. Maybe they do have something. Clifford, and you were born and bred San Franciscan. Well, I didn't commit myself, did I? No, but they do have something. A great deal. I'm always enchanted every time I go down there. Yes, it's quite a pretty country. Why, some of my best friends live in Southern California. Uh, Father, what's this new letter from the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, no doubt they, too, are urging us to go. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, do you know anyone at the Chamber of Commerce? Yes, certainly. Herb Chisholm. Herb Chisholm. Herbert M. Chisholm, the president of the San Francisco Junior Chamber of Commerce. Yes, he's a very dear friend of mine. Well, uh, what's the letter say, Dad? Yes? You want me to read it aloud? That's the general idea, Dad. I want to hear the letter from Pinky. Uh, just a moment, uh, Hazel. I'm about to read it. Uh, you ready? We've been ready for 20 minutes. Yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, dear Mr. Barber... As a native San Franciscan, I must confess amazement and shock as a result of reading the letter from President Martineau of the Los Angeles Junior Chamber of Commerce on June 26th. President Martineau is undoubtedly a city of Los Angeles citizen first, last, and always, and we think that his loyalty to his city is most commendable. But even to suggest that the barbers give up San Francisco in favor of moving to Los Angeles is to move in the realm of the fantastic. Well, yeah. <laughs> How can I move six kids anywhere? It's all I can do to move them up here to the Sky Ranch for the summer. <laughs> uh, uh, what would, nay, what could our southern neighbor offer in exchange for the Sea Cliff home site, commanding as it does a sweeping view of the approaches to one of the world's most spectacularly beautiful harbors? That a boy. Where could they duplicate the magnificence of our stately bridges? They are stately. The glory of our hills. Well, there are hills down there, I guess. Well, people just keep still while I read this. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to speak so sharply, Daniel, but I have trouble finding the line again when I lift my eye from the page. Go ahead, sir. The, the, the color of our districts, the quaintness of our cable cars, the zest of our climate, our rich and roaring past. Well, they roared a little down there, too, didn't they? Or is that another rumor? Our bright and shining future. In short, what could supplant the atmosphere that is San Francisco's alone? Right on. Very well said. Yeah. <laughs> this is not to say that Los Angeles isn't a nice place. We think it is a wonderful town to visit. And we hope that the barbers will be able to drop down there for a few days, if only to needlessly confirm that Angelinos do not prefer without cause to San Francisco as the city. Sincerely yours, Herbert M. Chisholm, President, San Francisco Junior Chamber of Commerce. Oh, boy. That's quite an answer, isn't it? But I don't want to move down to Southern California. They didn't ask us to move down, Claudia. Only visit there. 
And I, for one, intend to accept. Yes, sir, I think it's a very flattering bit of enterprise when a group of Los Angeles businessmen would go out of their way to invite us to go down this. Yes. And as I said, I, for one, intend to accept their invitation. It would be quite an affair to trek south and explore their fabulous area. Yes, it's a remarkable invitation. Let's not be reactionary about it. Well, look, what? <laughs> reactionary. Oh, says. look who's talking. Did you say I'm reactionary, Dad? Oh. Yes, uh, Southern California is a beautiful country. Don't forget it. Literally, thousands and thousands of people are moving there every minute. Well, that doesn't mean we have to join them. <laughs> you see how reactionary she is? <laughs> Why, I'd be willing to go and look at Southern California again. I looked at it once in 1914 and again in 1927, and I was down there once on a hot day in 1938. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I'm not going to close my mind to a flattering invitation. Why, they're building magnificent structures in Los Angeles. I don't suppose they'll ever be able to build anything to compare to our bridges, but they're constructing freeways to take care of their terrific traffic, and industries are moving there by train loads from the east. Well, there are some people who like it very much, Claudia. About 12,000 people a month with their automobiles prove that they like it immensely. Would their roads be so crowded if people didn't like it? Well, what about the smog? Smog? Well, what about our fog, Jack? No place is perfect in this world. The whole world, my boy. But I love our fog. It's different. It's the most beautiful fog in the world. <laughs> well, this is all fascinating, but I can't wait any longer to hear Pinky's letter. Are we ever going to read it, Dan? Yes, come on, old boy. Yes, speak up, Daniel. All right. Hold your horses, everyone. Here it is. It's from uh, Wilderness Camp Number 4. Dear Dan, your friend Mr. Lon Justin met me okay and brought me out here to the woods in a truck with his 10-year-old daughter, Trudy. And she's a brat. Uh-huh. Well, that's a rude thing to say. I, um... I am sitting in the foreman's office while Mr. Justin sees about my job. Trudy keeps running around saying, yeah, 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 what? and she just told me something I don't believe. What? <clears throat> she says you wrote Mr. Justin that it'd be good for me if he landed me the worst job in the whole of Siskiyou County. Dan! Huh? Go on, this sounds juicy. Oh, well, for the rest of oh, us... Oh, no, can... nothing doing. Read it now. Come on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Come on with <laughs> because she says you said the worst job in the whole of Siskiyou County would be good for my character. Oh, Dan, you didn't, did you? Oh, uh, well, uh, he, he, he goes on. Uh, I think she's just a brat and making this up, except that Mr. Justin asked me if I thought I could learn how to peel a potato. And he also said he was very fond of you and would do anything in the world you asked him to. It's kind of quiet and lonesome here, and a lot of lumberjacks don't like having boys around. And one of them just went past and said he always hated kids with red hair. But I guess he was just kidding. Mm. Love to all people. Dan, what have you done? Uh, who, me? Daniel Murray, what kind of a job did you ask them to get, Pinky? Well, now, my love... I don't I... know whether I'm your love or not. Uh, will you excuse us, everybody? Dan and I are going off somewhere and have a nice, quiet little talk. Uh-oh. Out behind the woodshed with you, Daniel. <laughs> That's what she thinks. Come on, my love. Boxing gloves at 20 paces and may the best man win. Why, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daniel wouldn't strike his... Uh, not with boxing gloves, Dan. Certainly not. But he might beat her over the head with a couple of red-hot exclamation points. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, beginning tomorrow night, One Man's Family will be heard on most of these stations every Monday night hereafter instead of Sunday afternoon. That's every Monday evening beginning tomorrow, July 4th. On the Atlantic Coast, you will hear One Man's Family at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time. On the Pacific Coast at 8.30 Standard Time. Check your local newspapers. But don't forget, beginning tomorrow, One Man's Family will be a weekly Monday night feature on NBC. <laughs> You've just heard Chapter 14, Book 70 of One Man's Family, written and produced under the direction of Carlton E. Morse. The opening chapter of Book 71, entitled A Reintroduction to the Barbers, will come to you tomorrow, Monday evening. Please check your local newspaper. One Man's Family comes to you from California. Lombardo makes music in the Harris time today on NBC.